thank you all for coming for the first stop in the band Big Money Tour. Um, we hope you find the evening informative, entertaining, and ultimately inspiring. Our mission at Dogwin is to put the decision-making power over our air, land, and water back in the hands of everyday British Columbians. Um, but really, we can't do that without the work of everyday British Columbians. At our core is a community of volunteers that really work tirelessly throughout the province to put on the table issues like oil tankers, coal exports, um, you know, the crucial phase we are in our, in our environment and concern for climate change. And it's without, without those people, we really wouldn't be able to move forward. Um, so I would like to welcome you all into the Dogwood community. Um, and I hope, you leave, I hope you leave here tonight feeling empowered to do something about the issues that, are, that face us. All right, I think we've heard enough. Thank you very, very much, my friend. Hey, 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 where's the love? All right, all right, sit down. Nobody paid to, uh, to hear you, my friend. Uh, time is money. So let's get going. <clears throat> You'll have to excuse me. I've been glad handing with some of the plebes. I've uh, picked up a terrible virus. <coughs> <coughs> terrible virus. My friends, I'm here to talk to you tonight because our beautiful British province is at a crossroads. That's right. I'm talking about money. Big money. Big, beautiful money. And that's what makes the world go round, but there are some people in this world who would call it evil. There are some people who would ban corporations from supporting the political party of their choosing, like banning a common leper from the jacuzzi on the family hot tub. Let's talk about human rights here. Need I remind you that corporations are people. They have a right to a voice in the political process just the same as every dead person in Esquimalt has a right to participate in the BC Liberal leadership race. Friends, we face the greatest challenge to corporate power in British Columbia in a generation. The unregulated profits of many of my closest overseas friends are at risk, and our political hammerlock on the BC government is slipping, like David Cameron wrestling a pig in a vat of Vaseline. We must take action. And that is why today I am announcing my candidacy for the Big Money Party of British Columbia. You'll be laughing out the other side of your face in six months, my friend. Our job is to put power back in the hands of the people who have earned it or inherited it. We have to put power back in the hands of the very, very wealthy. That's right. I'm talking about proportional representation. You deserve a voice in the legislature proportionate to the amount of money you are willing to give me right now. The starting bid is $10,000. Do I hear $10,000? Don't be shy, $10,000. Do I hear $10,000? $10,005. Anybody? $10,005? I'm just going to sell it to you. One of you is just going to get this. $10,005? You, sir. You, sir, just made yourself a friend. You can pick up your tax receipt on the way out. And for a limited time only, I'm offering sponsorship opportunities of a lifetime. For $10,000, this forearm, you can have your logo tattooed on this forearm, perfect for when I'm flipping pancakes at the Chamber of Commerce breakfast, am I right? $100,000 gets you a buttock of your choosing, and for a million dollars, just imagine, it's a little shiny right now, but every news conference, this prime piece of real estate, every media interview, my friends, don't be shy, open your wallets, open your hearts to the big money party of BC, innocent until proven guilty. Thank you, thank you. I've never worn an ascot. It's awful. It's awful. Well, welcome. Thank you very much for coming out on a... What day is it? So, uh, I'm only exaggerating slightly when I talk about the, uh, the state of affairs in British Columbia right now. Um, our politicians have more corporate sponsors right now than NASCAR drivers. I think... For the sake of honesty, they should wear little fireproof suits like this when they go and talk to the media. In fact, the only reason that we know who donates to these political parties goes back to a campaign in 2005 uh, in which Dogwood took part that forced disclosure of what the parties collect from their corporate donors and overseas donors. So who are we talking about? 
Enbridge. It seems almost too cartoonish to be real, but Enbridge, the company that's still trying to get social license and approval from the province of BC to build its pipeline and tanker project on the North Coast, they've given a quarter million dollars to the BC Liberals, and they keep giving year after year, even as everyone says, oh, the project is dead. Kinder Morgan, another corporate donor to, uh, to the governing party, TransCanada Pipelines, uh, these are the guys who want to build the big uh, LNG pipeline that would feed the uh, Petronas plant in the Skeena River Valley. Petronas, state-owned Malaysian multinational oil and gas company, Spectra Energy from Alberta, another big pipeline player. BNSF, that's Warren Buffett's coal and oil train company. They're hoping to uh, service the Macquarie-owned Fraser Surrey Docks. That's a company out of Australia that wants to ship eight megatons of thermal coal out of the lower mainland every year. Suncor, you'll recognize, major player in the oil sands. Canadian Natural Resources, that's Murray Edwards' uh, oil extraction company. And this is just a tiny, tiny sampling of the companies that have given to the governing party in the last couple of years. Murray Edwards, the owner of Canadian Natural Resources, also runs the Mount Pauly mine. Uh, this week, or last week, the BC government gave Mount Pauly uh, mining the, the go-ahead to reopen um, as before, after causing the largest uh, environmental disaster in BC history. And it's no coincidence that Edwards and his friends in, in Calgary, actually he moved to London to avoid the high taxes in Alberta, so he's now in England. But his, uh, his friends together have raised well north of a million dollars for the governing party. So if you add up the corporate donations to the BC Liberals from the oil and gas sector, coal and mining, we're talking about at least $8.6 million. This is just what's been totaled up by our friends in Integrity BC. So I'm curious. Uh, I don't just want to talk at you tonight. I'm, I'm curious what questions it raises for you to know that your coming election is being funded by these companies. Does anybody have any reaction? Yeah, it's easy to get the impression uh, some days that the government exists to sell BC off in bits and pieces, whether we're talking about Crown Corporations or public services or real estate. Uh, anybody else have any thoughts as we face, you know, the, <laughs> the looming climate crisis? Yeah. Well, one of my observations is is the uh, reluctance of the media to call a spade a spade. So, for example, this information, we hear this information periodically on major media about how corporations are buying influence, and yet there is this um, other, other story that's always sort of fed back to us that, yeah. well, of course it's not really to buy influence, it's to, what do they call it now, to, to, to uh, get their brand out, things like that. And, and just um, on an aside, I'm sure you're aware of it, yesterday the U.S. Supreme Court decided on a major case of corruption, they overthrew a lower court ruling, uh, which makes it much, much harder, this is the Supreme Court of the United States, mm -hmm. to hold public officials, it was a corruption case. So this is an argument that, that we've made, that if you're going to contribute to the political process in BC, you should be a voter in BC, that is an individual, not a corporation, not a numbered company, and certainly not from outside of the province. Because what are you doing donating to an election that you can't vote in? So we've you know, put the question to Premier Clark, and, and this is the response that she gave uh, last month on CBC Radio. She said, whatever anybody tells me or donates to me or my party, it cannot be connected to decisions we make on behalf of the people in BC, and it's not. So she flatly denies that there's any possibility of a connection between the amount of money that she collects from these companies and the decisions that her government makes. And all we have to rely on is uh, circumstantial evidence to the contrary. That's Tanoto, the Indonesian billionaire behind the wood fiber LNG plant, which was of course approved. So we can't in all of this let these guys off the hook either. Uh, be honest, anybody by a show of hands not know who this is on the screen? It's, yeah, it's very normal actually. You're, you're in the majority in BC. This is the leader of the BC NDP, uh, John Horgan, and he wants to be the premier next year. And he's promised to get rid of corporate and union donations if he's elected, but in the meantime, uh, they're taking as much as they possibly can to keep up with the BC Liberals. So Mr. Horgan, whoops, uh, in interviews, he's made it clear that he supports fracking, he supports LNG, he supports coal exports, and it's not a surprise 
that he's funded by these labor groups that support all of these projects because they would provide short-term jobs to their workers. So building trades, longshore union, steel workers. In fact, the NDP's in trouble this week because they failed to disclose $300,000 from the steel workers last year, which the BC Liberals caught, and so now they're in this back and forth. Nobody is taking the moral high ground in this. They're both slinging mud at each other for taking corporate money. What does John Horgan think about Kinder Morgan? Well, he was asked by a reporter earlier this month uh, for his take on the pipeline project, and he said, at this point, I don't see how this is in the public interest of British Columbia, and we'll see how the discussion goes over the next year or so. And he's made the same kinds of noises about the Petronas plant up in the Skeena, where uh, he said he opposed it in a filing with the National Energy Board, and then when the building trades yanked on his leash, he apologized to them and said he still had an open mind about the project. So you have clear examples of influence or of a trades union trying to, trying to exert influence over the opposition leader. So we could really just whack this uh, pinata all night and keep coming up with examples. This is literally something that you could spend hours and hours of doing, and every donation asks or raises another question. So we're talking about $107.8 million in donations to the governing party since Dogwood forced the disclosure in 2005. So corporate donations, the majority of that, 70.2. And just to give you an idea of where this is coming from, forestry, the liquor industry, law firms, numbered companies. Why is anybody donating to a political party through a numbered company? Lord knows. Uh, the new car dealers, pharmaceutical companies, and even trophy hunters. We, um, we're in a fun back and forth while our lawyers and the trophy hunters' lawyers are in a fun back and forth right now over a piece we wrote about their political influence. But the question was asked earlier by the, the gentleman on the aisle about where is the media outrage in all of this, and the media owners are donating to the political parties too. So, well, I should say the, the party, the governing party. So Glacier Media, which owns 27 uh, local publications in BC, including the Times Colonist, their publishers are supporters of the governing party, Post Media, Black Press. This is the entirety of print media in British Columbia, and all of their owners are supporters, financially, of the governing party. So those are not huge amounts compared to what some of the other donors give, but it lets you know which side they're on, and it puts the journalists that they employ in a very tricky position. Broadcasters, the dollar figures are a little higher. Shaw Communications runs global. They're the, they're the top-rated newscast in BC. The Rogers Group, Bell. We're talking about hundreds of thousands of dollars coming from the owners of the news channels that then are supposed to report on the politicians. Well, there's a story that we uh, ended up getting involved in a couple of years ago when Dan Murphy, who was an editorial cartoonist at the province in Vancouver, did a video making fun of Enbridge, and the video was yanked off the website, and he was called into his boss's office, and, uh, and a few months later, his position was eliminated. It turns out Post Media is a major, major advertiser in, or sorry, the, uh, the, the company Enbridge is a major advertiser in Post Media, and uh, he alleges that the, uh, the bosses leaned on him directly to, to please an advertiser. So we could play this game all night, but I really want to get to uh, my favorite part of this saga right now and, and the biggest chunk of corporate donations, which is from the real estate industry. Uh, so this is the presumptive Republican nominee, Donald Trump, in Vancouver. Uh, I presume that's why he brought a gold umbrella. Uh, and Eric and Donald Jr. and Ivanka, and the CEO of the Holborn Group, which is the developer that's building the Trump Tower in Vancouver. And sure enough, the Holborn Group is a donor to the governing party, and so are hundreds of other developers and realtors in BC. So we're talking about at least $12 million in donations from the lower mainland real estate industry, and now some of that is bleeding over to the island as well. So more sponsors of the current party, on top of Trump Towers, you have Rennie, of course. Bob Rennie is the chief fundraiser for Christy Clark and responsible for getting all these checks in the door. The Bank of China is a donor, and so is HSBC, uh, noted money launderers. Uh, and the reasons why those guys might be interested in donating to the provincial party will become clear, hopefully, in a couple of media stories very, very soon. But basically, what these companies have in common is that they have built a, a business out of shoveling offshore cash into land in Vancouver. And that is what's currently driving uh, not only house prices, but 
the provincial budget because we collect the transfer taxes every time a property is flipped, and that's what is balancing the budget right now. So I just went on the real estate listings today. Anybody have a guess what this property in Vancouver is worth? I hear 1.2, do I hear 1.3? 1.3, 1.4, 2, 2 million dollars, 3? 4.7, anybody, anybody want to go higher than 4.7? Correct. The asking price. If you go on the MLS listings today, this is on West 29th Avenue. It's on a residential street. It's a normal Vancouver house built in 1915. They're asking five and a half million dollars. And they're going to get it. So there's, there's a, I think it's fair to say a cancer eating away at the housing market in British Columbia right now. And the government refuses to apply treatment that might stop this influx of offshore cash. And in fact, the premier has built an entire economic vision out of this real estate craziness because nothing else in BC is growing right now. LNG did not pan out. They didn't build any projects. BC is not debt free. And so the only thing that's driving growth right now in the BC economy is the value on paper of houses in Vancouver and the construction to build more. So that's why this week, when the Premier announced her affordability strategy to help the middle class get into home ownership in Vancouver, her main answer is that they have to build more condos, that you're going to solve the demand problem by building more supply. So that is the entirety of the economic vision of this government. And it has real consequences for people, uh, including myself. This is a picture of my sister last week with my grandma. So my grandma's 93, and she was born in Vancouver, and we've been there for four generations. So the entire landscape in Vancouver, every neighborhood, is layered over with stories from my family. And the fact that my grandmother's lucid and, and continues to think it's important to share this with us is what makes me have any sense of cultural or regional identity. That's what makes me a British Columbian, a Japanese Canadian, a Vancouverite. But after the race riots and after the internment, the thing that's pushing my family out of Vancouver now is, is the housing crisis. And so my sister, if she ever wants to have kids and own property or get her life started, she can't do it in Vancouver. Uh, so she's moving uh, next month and she's one of my best friends, so that really sucks. Uh, so she's going 13 hours north up to the Skeena, and I can't say I blame her, uh, because right now, why would you play a rigged game if you're on the losing side? But what this is doing is it's tearing apart generations, and it's uprooting people from place. So if you don't have somewhere that you can call home, I know we're all settlers, those of us who aren't First Nations, but it's still a legitimate human need to put down roots and to raise your kids in the place where you grew up and to ensure some continuity of your values and of the place you live, and that's not possible right now, thanks to the economic vision of this government, fueled by the greed of the people who are calling the shots and donating all this money. So my sister's moving up to uh, the Kispiox River. I know it's not such a raw deal. Uh, it's a wonderful place, and, uh, and when I go and visit, it reminds me of what makes BC strong, and I think that we have gone through a real rough patch in the last... 200, 300 years, well, certainly the last 15. And I think, though, we still have the ingredients to, to come back from that. So don't forget, we live in a place where the very legal foundation of the land that we live on is different from in the rest of Canada. First Nations have enormous power in BC uh, to make decisions over land use in the public good, and that is curbing some of the greed that we're seeing from overseas developers and the fossil fuel industry. We have everything we could possibly need. We have all the wind and water and solar we could ever need to run our economy and power every car and home in the province. And we do have the natural resources and the farmland and the people and the governance and I think the, the economic foundations to come back from this, uh, this rocky period. So to get back to that vision of the province that we want to live in and to fix the climate crisis, and to take back some measure of power from overseas corporations, I think we have to go after the dragon right at its 
soft underbelly. And so that's why we launched the Ban Big Money campaign. So how do you dismantle a system this entrenched? Does anybody have any ideas? Just say no. <laughs> I wish the politicians would just say no. I think we could probably lean on a few of them to voluntarily abstain from taking this kind of money because it comes with such a moral compromise. And if voters tell them that we're factoring this into our decisions, I think that will make an impression. So you're suggesting a legal strategy. I mean, I've heard people start musing about a class action lawsuit against the government for basically destroying people's uh, dreams of being able to raise their family. Um, does anybody have any other ideas about how we can start chipping away at this? Because in one sense, it's very powerful, but in another sense, it's quite, it's quite vulnerable. Uh, at the back, yeah. This, this goes beyond one party, right? With the other parties have taken the stance that in order to, uh, to beat them, they're going to have to fight fire with fire. But it's a rigged game. You know, the, the, the opposition is never going to raise as much money again as the government. So how do you take apart a system where people can pay for influence over public policy? That's, that's a big step, right? Changing the law. Because that's a provincial law that governs both municipalities and the province. So this problem is just as bad. In fact, I'd say it's worse in municipal elections because we're talking about a much bigger amount of money proportional to the number of voters. I mean, the fact that Rob McDonald, a developer in Vancouver, could write a million dollar check to the NPA in the election before last, that tells you something is wrong with the system. So yeah, at the municipal level and at the provincial level, what we're thinking about is how do you, how do you rewrite that law? So what do you, what do you suggest? Anybody, I, I'm hearing... Rewrite the law, win the election. Um, so yeah, a point to add to that, in 1996, the BC NDP won a smaller proportion of the popular vote than the Liberals, but they won a majority on seats, right? So it, it works for both sides of the House. So you're talking about electoral reform, but to enact electoral reform, first you have to change the government. So I think, yeah, thought at the back. Yeah. There's an, that's an interesting point, because I was actually living in Quebec. I was working as a reporter in, in 2010, 2009 and 10, when the, the first cracks started appearing in the foundations of the Chagay government. And it wasn't these big stories about huge amounts of money moving one way or the other. It was potholes. It was snow removal. It was stories about how government services fall apart under this kind of corruption. And people realized that the bidding was totally rigged for all of these contracts. And in fact, the reason why they were so expensive is because they were baking the cost of the political donations into the bid, and then the government was just picking and choosing their buddies and then collecting the money on the back end. And we suspect that's, what happening, that's what's happening with Site C and with highway projects around the province. And so it's funny you should mention it because I was on the phone today with an investigative reporter who's doing a story about that. And so what happened in Quebec was that the public broadcaster did a couple of stories and they scratched this scab, and the government overreacted. And then a couple other reporters were like, oh, maybe there's something to this. And they started hearing stories about brown envelopes and intimidation on construction sites and bid rigging and collusion, and pretty soon there was just this pile on. And so there's a tipping point that you can hit where the media, which tends to travel in a pack, will suddenly jump on a story like this and just hammer it. And I think the timing is perfect. We're starting to see more coverage of this than we've seen in the last four years. And now, with less than a year to go before the election, that pace is starting to pick up. So I think that's part of the solution as well. Yeah, well, the woman from Quebec mentioned the, the idea of um, straw donors, or les, les prêtenants, which is when you uh, basically give a big Christmas bonus to everybody in the company, and then everyone involved donates under their own name. Right? And that's fairly easy to orchestrate, and it defeats some of the disclosure rules. But because there are no laws in BC against this kind of stuff, they don't go to very, uh, very uh, substantial efforts to try to hide their tracks. There's no laws. There's no laws against unlimited money from anybody anywhere in the world donating to BC. So yeah, linking together that idea of electoral finance reform and the election coming up in the media, so Aiden here at the front is actually building that uh, database right now, and we're, we're short a few thousand bucks. So um, the, uh, the plan is to fundraise to be able to complete that project and put a database online that combines both the, uh, the money coming in via donations, but also the contracts 
uh, awarded out so that you can start to cross-reference who's basically getting uh, what in return for their donation and, and more juicy stuff to come. So that's under construction. Well, we've been leaning on uh, all of the opposition parties, all of the MLAs, in fact, to, uh, to take a pledge not to take big money in the, in the next election. Now, they're resistant so far, but I think that if there's enough people in their ridings who are starting to say, I can't vote for you if you keep taking this money, one of them, it's like breaking a cartel. If you can get one candidate in a local riding to say, all right, I'm clean, then it puts pressure on all the others to say, okay, I'll renounce corporate money too. And eventually, you can isolate the one bad actor and you can actually inspire candidates uh, to, to uh, deliver a message to people that's not just like, oh, I know it's awful, but we all have to do it because those are the, that's the way the game is played, because that's not inspiring at all. Sure, so the existing law is that anybody, anywhere in the world, can donate any amount of money to any polit political party or politician in BC at the provincial or municipal level. Amounts over $250 have to be disclosed once a year in a giant PDF that the party just dumps on the electoral officer and then they post that to the database. But it's, uh, it's the worst uh, electoral finance system of any big province remaining in, in Canada and possibly matched only by Newfoundland uh, in terms of its, uh, its, its loopholes. The difference being that Newfoundland does not wield the same kind of power over the future of the global climate or indeed the lives of millions of people like the BC government. So this is a very, a very simplified uh, three steps that we're taking. Um, as the woman suggested, there is a petition that we've put up at banbigmoney.ca. Uh, and really, that has two effects. When you add your name uh, and your postal code to that petition, we're able to figure out exactly how many people care about this issue in a given riding, because that's what politicians care about. It's not just the overall number, but how many people who are actually going to be necessary to get them reelected. And the other thing is that it keeps you in touch with the campaign. And so over the next year, when there are actions that we think can actually tip the needle, uh, when there are things that you can do in a given riding to help amplify this issue, being in touch by email allows for big coordinated online actions to move offline. Um, the second step is to help with your local Dogwood team, and that's part of what we're doing tonight, is uh, getting together face-to-face. -to -face. It's, a, it's a weird thing. We don't do it very often anymore, it feels like, uh, but to actually get together and have conversations with other people in the same geographic area. So we're going to do that next. And, and then organize your neighbors. And so organizing your neighbors means building a voting block of people who know about this issue, are activated on this issue, and can speak to candidates in the lead up to the next election. And so we see two major pressure points coming up. One is the provincial election itself, where through the, I mean, through the interviews that John Horgan has given, he's actually shown himself to be quite malleable. If one union boss can pull him aside and get him to switch his position on a major project, I think that tens of thousands of citizens, perhaps even in Esquimalt Juan de Fuca, in his writing, um, could inspire him to take a stronger stand on this issue, and indeed, to take a pledge uh, to stop taking this money before the election. But the same applies to the BC Conservative candidates and the BC Green candidates in your riding. And in fact, the, the sooner we can get those candidates to start talking about running a clean campaign on individual donations, the more pressure we put on the other parties. So I think we have an opportunity to move the minds of those candidates when they're most vulnerable in the lead up to the election. And we've been able to do that successfully with the uh, pipeline and tanker issue in candidate town halls, on social media, in meetings with the candidates one-on-one. -on -one. And then in the election, I think this has the potential to be a major issue in a couple of ways. The real estate thing is really what's going to be the engine for the media locally in Vancouver that is now you know, what most of us get around the province. But I think there are stories in every community around the province that connect to this underlying system. And the database that Aiden's building allows you to go in and query when you wonder, like, how come that developer got special access or privileges from City Hall, or how come this project is happening and that one's not? You can go and verify those hunches locally and start building this broader provincial story into something very specific and local that affects the lives of the people in your neighborhood. And so I think we have the potential to make this into a major election issue. And regardless of what happens in that election, regardless of who wins, what we want is for the winner to have a mandate to make this change.
In other words, to get elected, they have to promise to make this change after the election. And then if they don't, or if a party wins again that refuses to change the donation regime, that's when we have recourse to the idea of a citizen's initiative, which the guy in the red t-shirt brought up. So there is a law in BC that allows you to write a bill and then take it around to your friends and neighbors and gather signatures and support. And if you can get 10% of the province behind that bill, it has to be introduced into the legislature. And when we saw what happened with the HST, the power of it is really in the organizing and the hundreds of thousands of conversations that you have with people around the province. That's the most effective way of making this into a major political millstone for the government. It's not the actual mechanism of the initiative. It's the fact that you go out and have 500,000 conversations with voters and it makes it impossible for the government to ignore. And that's why they held a referendum on the HST, which they then lost. So I think there are multiple pathways to victory, but all of them start with the same thing, which is communicating with each other horizontally, joining teams and working together in specific geographic areas, and then getting the word out to neighbors and organizing people who care about the future of this province and care about our democracy and making sure that they get out to vote with that knowledge on election day. I mean, how cool would it be to have a news conference with an independent, a BC conservative, a BC green, people who say, we don't agree about very much, but we agree about this, right? And so from now on, we're not gonna take money. And you'll see in our disclosure reports after the election. Uh, in fact, there's a disclosure that'll come up in the spring in April, just before the election. So we'll know if they've kept their word. So yeah, I think that's a, that's a great strategy. And the sooner we get to work on that locally, the better, because once the first domino falls, I think we'll see other ridings and other candidates from other parties who are forced to take the ethical position in order to keep the respect of the people who are gonna elect them. In the records of elections, you see the NDP got a certain amount of money, usually a small fraction, uh, from companies like Enbridge uh, right about spring 2013. And so during the lead up to the last provincial election, all of those major donors, including Calgary oil and gas companies, thought, uh-oh, the NDP is going to win. So they did exactly what the Bozas did in Victoria, which was like too close to call. Or in fact, the newspapers were saying this man would, would still win if he kicked a dog, right? So all of the, uh, the major donors that, that wanted to make sure they had a door open after the election donated once to the NDP. And since then, those donations have dried up. So you see this pattern in 2013 where, in fact, the NDP raised more money than the BC Liberals for one election cycle and one only. And that was because everybody thought it was inevitable they were gonna win. Um, so the money doesn't care. Money is money, right? It doesn't care about somebody's partisan background. It doesn't care about their platform. It just seeks an outlet. It seeks a, a way in to be able to influence whoever takes power and makes decisions. So yeah, we saw a big uh, tsunami of money slosh over to the NDP and then slosh straight back to the Liberals. In fact, Rich Coleman reportedly had meetings where he sat on the edge of his desk and made them come in one by one and grovel and, and promise never to donate to the NDP again. And then he held a party with a banner that said, we won, it's Christmas every day. And then they started giving out road contracts. So that's how this government operates.